something to do. My God is not a has-been. So we will not live in what has happened. We will live for what is taking place right now. Right now. I am excited in this word. This word this week is to bring us to a place of completion from where we were last week. Because last week we talked about process. So before we get started, let me pray over this word so we can move. Lord God, I thank you for your word today. <sighs> settle me. Settle the hearts of your people. Not settle, Lord God, to where we reach a place of comfort, where we not hearing, Lord God, but anything that distracts, anything that disturbs, drive it out of these walls. We need to hear from you today, Lord, because we know that your word teaches us that our faith comes by our hearing and the hearing of your word. So, Lord, I thank you for finding me faithful enough to deliver your word today in the hearing of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, I want to talk again, not about the power of waiting, but this week, <laughs> we're talking about living your best life, living the best life. I'm not going to say you're living the best life. Best life has been defined so many times by excess in the world. Best life has been defined as having what you want. Best, find, best life is defined by riches and living just crazy lives. When I, when I look at stuff sometimes and people are talking about they living their best life and I'm like, wow, man, y'all got a long way to go to learn what, what best life is all about. I'm so thankful I haven't seen my best yet. I'm going to say something, and I want us, this is going to be the theme throughout everything that I teach today, and I want it to be a theme for your life. God wants to bring us to good, but he doesn't want to leave us at good. He wants us to progress from good to better, and from better, we'll learn how to receive the best life for us as individuals. Because my best life can't be measured by what you do. My best life is not about what's on social media. Nobody can suggest your best life to you. And you cannot go from bad to best because you're not equipped in your character to enjoy best when you just went from bad. That's why some people get upset with the church because I, I, I've been going to church, so why have I not gone to the best? There has to be something built up inside of you. There has to be a character so that when you are on the way to the best, you'll be able to stand there. Nobody can take your good or your better away from you on your way to your best. You don't owe any person on earth anything. Because you know God did it. And the people who poured into your life are people that God sent into your life. This is a process. As I said last week, the process is a period of time, a series of actions that we have to go through. In order to get to the results that we're looking for. We have to go through these things to get to what we're looking for. It's so crazy that. We want so much sometimes, but we don't even realize that God wants more for us than we can even imagine. But we want it on world terms. You know, I had to talk to myself years ago before I bought the vehicle that I'm driving now. I want a truck. I still want a truck. But my neighbor that used to live across the street 
policeman. He got the big red truck that I had looked at. And when he got that big red truck with them big tires on it, it was like, ah, I wanted this just to have something to look at. I wanted to have something that I could ride down the street and people say, wow, look at that big red truck. It was not a part of anything need. It wasn't even a part of what. See, now I am in a place of I want it and I believe God's going to let me have it. All right. But I had to come. Listen to what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with wanting. But I had to come to an appreciation. I had to come to an appreciation because if you don't define your wants, your wants will take you over. If you don't define the things that you want and you hold yourself and let God hold you captive, those things will come and captivate you. This is how we're going to live the best life. This is how we're going to live the best life because there is something out there that we haven't seen and we haven't gone through because we're still in the process. Tell somebody, I'm still in. I'm still in. See, the best life is not a point that's going to come in everybody else's life. My best life, I don't know if this is it or not. Best life is not going to mean that you're free from worry. Best life is not going to mean that you're going to stop desiring things. Come on, somebody. We have all these crazy desorts, uh, thoughts of utopia and, 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 and I don't know, no, this, this weird nirvana that, oh, I, I, I'm going to get to a place one day where I'll be so happy. Yeah, you will for about 10 minutes. <laughs> You'll be just as happy. And the thing about that red truck is, after my neighbor got that red truck, I saw a black truck that I like better. <laughs> because there's always something better. So until you define what's in you, you'll never be able to define what you really want. This is why I say we have to be in the process to be able to define what we really desire. Because most of our desires have come through our sensuality. I've seen it in a book. I've seen it on social media. I've seen somebody else with it. I've heard about it. But that's still not about me. It's still not about what's going to be good for me. It's not going to be about what's long-term pleasurable for me. Amen? Amen. Oh, my God. See, when we try to circumvent the process to guarantee outcomes, when I say circumvent the, out, uh, circumvent the process, that means when I get two more jobs other than my other job, and I go borrow as much money as they let me have, and then when I get it, I say, oh, the Lord has blessed me. No, you don't work your fool self to death. You quit trusting God on job number three. You quit trusting God when you didn't have time for church. You didn't, you didn't have time for nothing but to work. And then you're going to turn around. Well, the Lord blessed me with this. You didn't wait for the Lord to bless you. You tried to circumvent the process, but we don't understand. There's nothing wrong with working. There's nothing wrong with working a couple of jobs. I didn't work but, but one job, but on that one job, I, I worked 12, 14 hours or whatever I needed to work. Whatever I needed to work within that job to acquire the things that I desired. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, you have to make sure that I hold myself in charge of these things so these things are not in charge of me. I'm not going to work myself till I pass out for things. I learned a long time ago, when you do that, the doctors get all the money. <laughs> you be laid up, you can't even appreciate the money. Got a new car, can't drive why? I can't move. I wait for somebody to help me move my legs. What's wrong with your legs? I work for the car. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But I want us to really look at the situation that we're in too because when we try to circumvent the process, we become blind to our effort to manipulate the process. Everybody thinks that manipulation is a social tool 
or something that people do to have their way. Many times people have not understood, even in the body of Christ, that manipulation is a devilish personality trait. When you turn on your charm, your whatever it is that you turn on to try to manipulate a situation, that's the devil. That is a devilish trait. That's because of our sin nature. I'm not saying that you're possessed by a devil, but that's a part of our sin nature because now I'm not even trusting in my real personality. I'm bringing up a false personality to try to trick you and then you giving me what I want. Oh, my God. See, we have to understand this thing because even in the process, there's an enemy. Even while we're waiting on God, that there is an enemy. The process leads to prosperity, glory to God, but the process also leads to knowledge. Because prosperity without knowledge is going to end up, have you end up in worse shape than you were before prosperity came. Ah, oh, my, 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 my. We have to gain the ability to live a skillful life. To live a skillful life, not a ragtag. Let me see what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to be next. And I'll just flip a coin and see what I'm going to do next. No, we need to be able to figure this thing out with God and live a skillful life because my skillful life is not going to look right to some of y'all. That's why I want to talk to you today. That's why I want to talk to you today. Because waiting is still a part of the process. Now, I know last week I talked about waiting and I was talking about the blessings and I was talking about the, the miracles and I was talking about the, the, the answered prayers. I was talking about all the things that, that, that we, we miss out on because we don't want to wait. I, I talked about all those things, but those things are only the beginning because this is why this week is, is the finishing of the thought from last week. All of those things are well and fine, the miracles and the blessings and the answers of your prayers and all of that. But it's not as important as living a skillful life. Yeah. <sighs> Let's go back and understand what waiting is. Waiting is to stay. Waiting is to watch. Waiting is to hope. Waiting is to trust. Waiting is to have faith and anticipate. The Hebrew they say that waiting is becoming as one, being entwined, entwined, entwined. Twined is something that's continuously twisted together, twisted together, twisted together. So you don't know one from the other. God says this is what the waiting is going to do in the process. That, that people will be looking and, and they'll be trying to figure out if it's you or God and God or you and you will start walking with God and you'll know that it's not me, it's God, but it is me, but it is God. Yeah. Because you're intertwined with God and you're not trying to figure it out anymore and you're not trying to separate yourself from God because God now has been come intertwined and you're laying down and you're waking up and everything in between. Because I'm not trying to wait for a time to manipulate God with my prayers and my tears now. I'm bringing God in on my bad. I'm bringing God in on my good. I'm bringing God in on my sin. I'm bringing God in on my holiness. I'm bringing God in on every area and aspect of my life so that we can become so intertwined now that I'm not worried about if it's me anymore because God is so wrapped up in me because I got myself wrapped up in him. I got myself so wrapped up in him. Ah. See, I'm believing today that everyone who hears this word understands that there's a wholeness to life that we mature to that's much more than blessings and miracles. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in Isaiah 40, and this is scripture that we hear a lot of and have heard a lot of in 31, those who wait on the Lord. But I want to back it up to 28. Because the whole chapter, the whole 40th chapter begins with a promise for broken people. Come on, somebody. See, this is where we have to learn to live life skillfully because when you, when things are going good, you can still be broken. When things get better, you still get broken. When you have moved from bad to good, you're still broken. There are some times in your life that your heart's going to be broken. 
there's some times in your life that you're going to feel left out. And you think that when you go from good to better, those times are going to go away. It's not. But there's a promise from God that I'm not going to stop right now. I'm not going to leave you where you are right now. It's a continuation. Amen. Amen. The early part of the chapter, if you have time at home, read the early part of, of chapter 40 in Isaiah. And I heard something interesting uh, about the history of Isaiah. God used Isaiah's nakedness as part of the process of growing him. There was a period of time where God made him to be naked. I want you stripped down and bare. I want you to get to the place where you can't be embarrassed. Because when people look at you and see you for after a while, they'll say it's normal. Come on, somebody. That's deep right there. The strip down you that God is trying to pull up in you so that he can use you like he used Isaiah. The strip down you, people are going to walk around and, and make fun of it sometimes. They're going to point fingers. They're going to talk about it sometimes. But after a while, they'll say, oh, that's just them. That's who they are. That's that being entwined, entwined with God. I'm not embarrassed anymore because this is what God said for me. In order for me to get from one place to the other, sometimes I have to face embarrassment. We don't like that. Sometimes I have people who will talk about me. Sometimes, like David said, the one who broke bread with me at my table is the one that's going out talking about me behind my back. But this is what has to take place for me to move from this one place. This are, these are the actions that have to take place in my life for me to be able to go from place to place, from move to move. In 28, he says, have you not known? Have you not heard? This is not rhetorical. He says the same thing in 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? Neither faints nor is weary. Don't you know something about God? What's your level of knowledge about God? Living your best is always going to be connected relationally to where you are with God. And people want to think it's connected to your education, it's connected to your money, it's connected to who you know, it's connected. Let me tell you something, that's in the world and I have nothing against what's in the world. I don't have anything to do, I mean, anything against knowledge and, and wealth and, and being shrewd in business and all of those stuff. We need Christians to be shrewd in business. We need Christians who are extremely knowledgeable in world, uh, 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 in the world, things of the world. We need Christians, glory to God, who are in Hollywood, who are in the studio, who are, who are doing these things, who are professors on the university, teachers in school. We need them to be engineers and CEOs, but we don't need them just to lean on their own understanding. Amen. See, this is what we miss out on. This is what last week was teaching about blessings, but now I'm going to teach you about the life blessings and living life skillfully because if you got some money, I don't care if it's $10, you trust God, what's what God do with it? Yeah. If you got a little bit of knowledge, look at what God will do with your little bit of knowledge. If you got a gift and a talent, and don't say you don't because everybody that God birthed has a gift and a talent. Yes. But we look at other people's gifts and talents and we don't even take time to nurture our own gifts and talents because we're so busy admiring what somebody else can do. Wow, I love the way that brother can walk on here and his hands and upside down. And, and I forget how to walk like God told me to walk because I'm looking at what God gave him to do. Have you not known? Have you not heard? This is the highway to the best life. This is the road to the best life. This is where you keep on driving from good. And sooner or later, you don't even realize, man, I turned the corner back there. I've been on better for about four years and didn't even realize it. And see, some people in the church have not realized that they have been living better 
Because they're looking around with what everybody else got, and they're looking at things and saying, well, I would have had more things, I thought, if I would have been with God. This, I would have thought by this time I would have had my house paid off. I thought that I would have had the woman of my dreams by now. I thought that I would have been able to do this, this, and this by now. I thought. But see, your thoughts are not God's thoughts. Come on, somebody. Your ways are not his ways. And if you want to receive the things from God, you better get on board and ride behind his thoughts. You better submit yourself to his ways because he has some things to you, for you, that your eyes have not seen. No, your ear heard. Glory to God. Come on, somebody. This is what happens sometimes with those of us who believe our thoughts. And you don't even know how to appreciate the better that you're in right now. You don't know how to appreciate the better that you're in right now. You don't give him glory. You don't say thank you for the better because the things that you were thinking you were supposed to have, but you haven't learned and you don't have the maturity or integrity. God hadn't said no. God just waiting for you to grow up enough before he give you the keys. I ain't talking about keys to the car. I'm talking about keys to money. I'm talking about keys to the relationship. I'm talking about keys to a marriage. Come on, somebody. Amen. Have you not known God? Have you not heard about the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of all the earth? He don't get tired. He don't get weary. He don't run out of stuff. Do you not know the source? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He not only says the sheep know me, he says, I am known by my sheep. I am known by my sheep. <laughs> but in Galatians 4, Paul opens this thing up sometimes in over in 8 and 9. He says, after we are known of God, what is it about us that has us to revert back to the weak things in life, to the beggarly ways? What is it about us? That even after we are known by God, we revert back. We revert back because we don't even understand that better is taking place right now. So since I don't recognize better because better don't line up with what I thought it was supposed to look like, I revert back. Not to good, I revert back to bad. Because I couldn't do it doing good, so I think I'll try it doing bad again. Oh, come on now. I'm talking about the truth of the church. It's some folks that have walked away from their church experience. It's some folks that have walked away from their relationship with God because it didn't work out like they thought it was supposed to be. The marriage didn't work like they were supposed to be. The money didn't work like they were supposed to be. The business didn't work like they thought it was supposed to be. So they didn't go back to try to work God's good. They said, I'm going to try doing bad. I'll go on back and see what bad will do. I'm a believer, but I'm going to do bad. And I'm expecting God to do something in my bad. And you wonder now why you have to start all over in your maturity process in your place of understanding because then after so many years of going back to bad it's a struggle to get back to good then you start shouting all over again about the goodness of God and people like me look at you and like you could have been here five years ago now I gotta go home and repent because I'm looking at you funny I gotta go and repent because I'm looking at you I don't watch you be just dumb because you could have been here five years ago, but you wanted to go back. You went back to the weak ways, the beggarly ways, the ways of this world. This thing that almost killed you, drug you up and down the street, treated you like a fool, put your name out on front street, told everybody about all the bad things. You went back to that because it didn't work doing the better, because you didn't recognize better. Amen? Amen. And like I said, I have to go home and repent. Because I shouldn't say it. But I got to go home and repent because I said it. You should have been here five years ago. Now I got to go back every week, every month. And tank, take you a big old thing of milk. You ain't ready for meat no more. You ought to be teaching somebody by now. That's what Paul said. You ought to be able to teach somebody something. You ought to be able to teach somebody something other than your hard times. I'm so unhappy. It's so crazy. 
believing in God and the first thing come out, the devil is busy, the devil is busy, the devil is busy. How about how good God is? God woke me up. I love that the brother said, God, you woke me up this morning. You allowed us to see another day. The success is in the day. The success is in the waking up. You woke up to brand new mercy. You did some scandalous things, but you woke up to brand new mercy. You told some lies, but you woke up to brand new mercy. You didn't do what God told you to do yesterday, but you woke up to brand new mercy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we got to live skillfully. But we won't live skillfully if we don't know the source. We have to know the source. We have to submit the so to the source. I never know what the source has for me while I'm focusing on what the source is doing for you. Mm. I'm not talking about people outside. I'm talking about how people from church to church. I'm talking about how smaller churches sit around and model themselves after mega churches. Instead of growing wherever God wants them to grow. And then the people get weary because we're taking on a model that's not ours. Because the people that I do know that pastor mega churches, it was a long growth process. It was a process of learning. It was a process of pain. It was a process of suffering. We look at the outcome and says, oh, I want that. So what do we do? We look at what someone else has and don't look how, learn how to work in what God has given us. This is what, what God has given us. You know, I, I heard something, and I, you know, sometimes I listen to things, and sometimes God will make me listen to people that are Christians, but I don't particularly agree with them and I was about to not agree with these people because to me they just seemed elitist and privileged but then the man said it's not always about a father in a house that'll turn around some of these communities. When he said some of these communities, I was like, yo, dude, go on and say it. You know what you're saying. Some of these communities. You wasn't talking about the trailer park and you was talking about some of these communities. So I'm like, okay, this is the Keith, the personal Keith getting upset. But he spoke a word after that. He says, the Lord showed me that I needed to study this so that I could come correct when I say these things. He says, even if there is not a man in the house, if there are men stationed in the neighborhood who are fathers, the whole neighborhood gets better. I said, glory to God. Glory to God. If there are men in the neighborhood that are fathers. I didn't say rich fathers. I didn't say fathers who wore suits every day. But this is what God is trying to tell us. We got to quit complaining about what we got and draw on what we got. We're complaining about what we don't have and we, we don't even draw on what we do have. Well, I'm this way because, cause, cause, you know, I, my daddy, my daddy wasn't ever, my daddy wasn't ever. No, no, no. That's a cop out of an excuse. That's a cop out of an excuse. Any man that hears this, I want to tell it to you. No, my father was not in my house or in my life growing up. And what that made me do was declare as a kid that I will not do this to my child. I will not do this to any children that I have a seed in. I will not be an absentee father. I don't care how many miles I am away. They will know me and they will know that I am in their lives weekly, daily if possible. Glory to God. I am I'm interested in them. We can't keep on talking about what we didn't have and that made me what I am. You look at that wrong and you do right. Glory to God. See, because listen, I learned a long time ago that you know what? My father wasn't at my game, but then I'd go to church and I hear about a father that was at my game. I'd hear about a father that was at my concert. 
And I grabbed hold to that. So as I got older, and my father and I knew each other. I mean, it's not like he, he just lived in, 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 in Denver and, 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 and Oklahoma and California. I mean, we just never. But what I'm saying is I just brought all of this out to say we can't look at what didn't happen and allow that to say this is what's going to happen with me. That's not living life skillfully. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has anybody ever told you about God? Has anybody ever told you about the power of God? Has anybody ever told you about the love of God? Has anybody ever told you about the forgiveness of God? Come on, I want somebody to learn to live skillfully in this life. Amen? Oh, my God. In verse 31, he says, listen, this is what we... Uh, uh, mostly familiar with, but those who wait upon the Lord. And I, I, I read that, and just this morning the Lord says, those, those who wait. This again comes to a decision. How do you want to live? God is not going to make you do anything. God is not going to make you do anything. He's not. He says those, because there are some who know the source but won't give over the control. We ain't talking about those who never known God, those who've never heard the word of God, those who don't know the difference in right and wrong, those who don't know the difference in God and devils. No, we're not talking about those who don't know that. We're talking about those who do, but refuse. Refuse to give up their individuality. Refuse to trust in the Lord. Refuse because they're so intent on having things their way. And it's almost like they got God on the payroll. God, I'm expecting you to do this here. I ain't doing nothing that you tell me to do, but I'm expecting because I believe. But the Lord showed me about Isaiah. 31 says that those who stay with God, those who hope in God, those who put their trust in God, those who become entwined with God, those people, those are the people, those are the people who will see the renewal of their strength. Huh? We're talking about new strength. We ain't talking about this raggedy stuff I had when I was all broke down and not knowing how I was going to get up and tie my shoes today. I said new strength. He says those that become entwined with me will come up with new strength strength that was theirs but they never operated in it see you don't realize right now that there are some things that is yours but you've never operated in it it's tied up in God it's tied up in your relationship with God it's yours but you haven't operated in it because we are so busy being taught that the blessing is mine and that's what I got to go get and, and, and the, the healing is mine, and that's what I got to go get. Well, those are things are wonderful, but there are some strengths. There are some knowledge that is yours, but you want only the good things. You only want the blessings. You want those things that you can go and brag somebody about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <sighs> Very few people brag about godly wisdom. <laughs> Come on now. We got to get to this thing of understanding that God says, I want you to fly. But now it becomes personal. This is your strength. This is your strength. This is your run. This is your race. This is your walk. Come on, this is about you now. It's not about the people around you. It's about the choices that you make as an individual for your life. I told you last week, David, you know, Okay, he had to wait, what was it, 15 years to become king. He knew how to fight. He knew how to write beautiful songs. He knew how to write poems. He could write love letters to God. He could do that. But he didn't know how to be an administrator. He didn't know how to be a leader. He didn't know how to set a cabinet up. He didn't know how to do certain things. We need to understand that we are not where we want to be sometimes because God is trying to send people in our lives to teach us to be what we want to be. Trying to send us people in our lives to show us how to achieve what we wish to achieve. Come on, somebody. I said last week Abraham heard and Abraham believed. And because Abraham believed, 
it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now he received all of this from God and he received a promise from God. And Abraham went from bad to good. He got out of his daddy's house. He quit living at home with his daddy. He was living home with his daddy. Y'all go back and read the Bible. I don't care how y'all want to play. God said, come out of here. Come away from your family. I'm tired of you living with daddy. See, because I'm not going to deal with you as long as you depend on somebody else. Come on. Come on, somebody. I I'm talking to somebody. I don't care if it's online. I don't care if you see it on YouTube. You're still depending on somebody else for only the thing that God can bring into your life. And you refuse to let that thing go. And you've heard the promise of God. You have heard God. You have heard God and you can't even understand why God has spoken to you. You can't even understand why God has given you the promise. But you still want to depend on what's comfortable. Well, the process is not comfortable. The process is not easy. And the process can be downright scary. Amen. Amen. But it will take you to the results that you're looking for in life. Better than that, it will take you to the place that God has already set aside with your name on it. I said with your name on it. Abraham had to learn how to walk in that righteousness that faith had afforded. Let me show you something that, that this righteousness brought on. And we understand he, he offered up Isaac. But the Lord gave me a, a train of thought. In Genesis 14, just write it down. I'm just going to skip around a few things here. For those who've never read the story or know the story, Lot was taken captive, captive 14 and 1 in days past, in, in the days of Amraphael, the king of Shinar, Ariok, the king of Elisar, Clodomir, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of nations, that they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, Beersha, the king of Gomorrah. And all that was said because I wanted you to understand what took place. Look at how many rulers came against this place that God despised. He despised the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was something there. Let me show you what God's love will do. When you go from bad to good. And they, they, they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. There are times that you don't understand that you are living better because the love that God has for you will give you the strength and power to help out that knucklehead that treated you bad. Lot treated Abram bad. But that was still his nephew. And he still loved him. God wants you to understand this is what the better is all about so you can understand how to appreciate the best. That the love that he has for you, it will give you the power and the strength to help those that you love. Not because they're living right, because he loves you. Yes, yes. Not because they are in relationship with him, because you're in relationship with him. Yes, yes. And you're sitting there cursing at them because they don't have a relationship with God. Strengthen your relationship until they can get in. Yes. Pray for them until they can get in. Trust in him until they can get in. I don't know about y'all, but somebody prayed for me. Yes. Somebody trusted God on my behalf. Somebody talk to God about me. Glory to God before I wanted to talk to God. Come on now. And it was because of somebody else's love and their relationship and their love for me. They had a love for God and a love for me. A love for God and a love for me. And that's what kept me all those nights. We don't understand it sometimes. So Abram went after him. And Abram went after him and he won. He won Lot back. But this is what I want to talk to you about walking, learning to walk in the righteousness of God. In 14 and 18, then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. 
Bread and wine. That's what we do. We call it communion. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram. And Abram gave him a tithe. And now the king of Sodom came to Abram and says, give me the purses and take all the goods to yourself. Abram gave a tithe to Melchizedek, who was on the order of Jesus. Listen to what I'm saying. If you read your Bible, you'll know that Melchizedek was a type of Jesus. He gave a tithe to him. But when the king of Sodom wanted to give him something, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. Have you not known? Have you not heard? That's what Isaiah was saying. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Years earlier, Abram had not reached this point of maturity, but he had reached a place of maturity where he says, I raise my hand to the Lord, God most high possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I will, take, I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say, I've made Abram rich. I don't want nothing from the devil. Come on. Come on. That's when you're growing up. This is why the process is hard. That thing got to be broken. You just got somebody giving you something. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'll take it. Sometimes you got to grow up and understand I can't take everything that somebody want to give me. It will hinder my growth sometimes just to take whatever somebody want to give me. Don't think that you are supposed to receive a reward from people for the things that you do that are godly. Come on, somebody. We think that we're always supposed to get a reward from people when we do godly things. But sometimes God says, you better consider the source that's handing you something. Because you're taking this cursed thing home with you. You're taking this defiled thing home with you. You're taking this thing that came from the, hands, from the straight from the hands of the devil that went into their hands. And now you're going to put it in your pocket and declare that God gave it to you. That's why Abram said, I raised my hands. I submitted myself to God. Everything that I've done, I've done in submission to God. I didn't do it because I like you. This is what we got to get to sometimes. I didn't do it because I like you. I didn't do it because I want something from you. I did it because I love that boy over there. I love my brother's son, my brother dead, and I love that boy right there. I disobeyed and brought him with me when God told me to leave him. That's how much I love him. Y'all better hear me in here today. This is this, this is this life growth. This is this life growth that we need, and we, we don't even realize that this is what we're looking for. See, we don't understand that Abram's best life was not in Isaac. Isaac's best life didn't look like his daddy. Because Isaac did not have the same aspirations as his daddy. Isaac had twin sons and was like, oh, well, all right, ain't no big deal. He wasn't interested in being the father of many nations. Abram's best life came out of his business-like faithfulness to God. His best life came much, we talk about the miracle that happened in 99 when Isaac was born at 100. We talk about that miracle, but the greatest miracle came with the six sons that came later after he had buried Sarah, after he had found a wife for Isaac, after he had got everybody's life straightened out. Then he went and God sent him a young woman. And she gave him six sons. Six sons. He waited all of that time to have one. Well, the one that he had with the bond servant, God said, give it away. You got to send him away. You don't understand sometimes God is going to tell you to send some stuff away. You got to send some stuff away in order to have the promise. You got to send some stuff away. Come on, somebody. You got to send some stuff away in order to have the promise from God. You can't grab hold of everything that you did and says, well, this is the product of my. No, this is the product of your foolishness. This is the product of somebody else's idea. This is not what I had for you. Sometimes you got to turn it away. You got to send it away in order to have the promise that God has for you. Somebody said, I'll send it away. I'm going to tell you, brother, because today, according to the world today, the first 40 years of Moses' life was the best life. 
He living in Pharaoh's house. He living the best life. I know he living his best life. His stepdad is the ruler of all things. Greatest, greatest uh, 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 nation on the planet at the time. And he is the stepson. He gets to call the shots. Everybody out here today will be saying that's his best life. That's his best life. No, that was not his best life. Hebrews will tell you where his best life came. Glory to God. In Hebrews 11 mm, and 24, it says, by faith. Somebody say, by faith. by faith. See, this is how you learn to live. This is how you learn to live skillfully. You learn to live skillfully by faith. Skillfully by faith. He says, by faith, Moses, when he had become of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, choosing to suffer the afflictions with the people of God rather than enjoying the passing pleasure. I said the passing pleasure of sin. Sin gives you pleasure for a little while, but it's passing by. Sin is going to give you something for a little while, but you can't hold on to it. The devil will offer you something that looks good right now, but it's going to turn and rot on you. Glory to God. You got to understand now. You got to make up your mind whether you're going to keep on putting God off for a passing pleasure. You're going to put God off for this thing that's going to rot in your hand. You keep on crying and whining to God because something turned on you. Because something turned rotten on you. Because things didn't go right. Because the pleasure didn't last long. And you're crying out to God, but God is saying, I didn't want you to have it. You would have never got to what I wanted you to have if you keep on taking gifts from the devil. Somebody say amen. amen. That process, that process, we don't understand because we don't talk about it as much. Doing the process of, 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 of what Moses went through. Moses had to learn how to humble himself. Moses had to learn how to be a shepherd. E Egyptians looked down on shepherds, said they were filthy, nasty people. They said they were filthy, nasty people. So now, being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, he had to become one. Why did he have to become one? Because he had nothing else. He had to humble himself for 40 years. God found him on the backside of a mountain. I said God found him on the backside of a mountain. What a few little scrappy sheep that belonged to his father-in-law. They weren't even his. But during the process, God had to deal with his anger issues. God had to deal with, with his left, uh, lack of, of, of self-confidence. This is a man when God says, go speak to one man, say, I don't talk good. But as he continued to walk with good God, he began to either speak better or have confidence in God because he was intertwined with God. He became so entwined with God that he wasn't worried about Aaron. He told Aaron, shut up. He went to the Pharaoh and said, look, by the end of this day, I'll not have to worry about you no more. You ain't going to cause me no problems no more. God is getting ready to shut you down, getting ready to shut your kingdom down. He had himself together because it wasn't him talking. It was God entwined with him talking. But he had to go through that process. These things that you're afraid about, your things you're looking at yourself that you lack. God says, in this process, you'll be moving from one place to the other and don't even realize how I raised you up. Amen? Amen. No self-confidence. I'm not talking about bragging. I'm talking about your self-confidence. Come on, come on, come on. If everybody looks in themselves, there's some areas that we're not confident in. Not confident in my education. Not confident in how I look. I'm not confident in how I talk to people. I'm not confident in where I was brought up. I'm not confident. I'm not confident. Come on, somebody. There's some black folk walking around with PTSD ain't confident because they are black. Ain't that a shame? Come on now. There's some poor folks still walking around ain't confident in God because they was raised poor. But even before Moses, there was a man named Joseph. Even before Moses. And we want to look at Joseph and we want to look at how the favor of God was always with him. And the favor of God was with him. If you read Genesis. But sometimes when we're looking at the favor of God being with him, we forget about what he had to go through. From 17 to 30, life was hard. 
And what we look at as his best life is when he was called out of the prison and brought into the palace. No, his best life was when he was reunited with his father. The best don't look the same to everybody. The position of being second in command of Pharaoh was not his best life. When those brothers who left him in a hole told daddy he was dead came, he turned and he wept bitterly. The Bible says one time he had to go off into a room and he wailed. He wailed because he loved them. No matter what they had done to him, no matter how they treated him, he wanted to be reunited with his family. And we take this and we read it in Genesis, but we miss all of the parts that actually took place in Psalm 105. It says, Mm. In Psalm 105, 17, it says, He sent a man before them. Before who? Before Israel. Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And they hurt his feet with feathers. They hurt his feet with feathers. You, you don't see that in, in, in Genesis. The fetters, the chains, the, the things that they locked around his ankles. And they hurt his feet. And he shuffled like every other prisoner. And we like to talk about how he had the good life because the grace of God was always with him. But we don't understand the suffering that took place. Because he had received a promise and he had gone and told his brothers and even his father the dream that God had given him about being a ruler. So God says, I got to break this obnoxious spirit off of you and bring you to a place of humility. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him as I get ready to bring this thing to a close on how to live. I want to talk to somebody about what Joseph went through. We love to uh, re repeat what, uh, what, what, you meant, what the enemy meant for harm. God meant it for good. We don't keep reading what it says, so that I can bless somebody else. So that I can raise up a people. God didn't have me in mind just for me in mind. Come on, somebody. God did not have me in mind just for me in mind. God raised me up so that I can be a blessing somebody else. So that my suffering could be a bridge for somebody else to come over. So that when my sin is revealed, come on, somebody. When my sin is revealed, that'll stop somebody else from walking in sin's door. Come on, somebody. See, sometimes we read the story of Joseph and we get it twisted, glory to God. But in today's atmosphere, some people will think they're living the best life in Potiphar's house because I, I done come up from where I was and I done got out of jail and I'm, I'm working for this cat right here and I'm second in command of his house. You don't even realize God got a bigger place for you. But I, and look here, every once in a while, you know, me and his wife, you know what I'm saying? Come on, I'm going to talk to the people who think they're doing something. They think they're doing something because they're hooking up with Potiphar's wife. I want to talk to these people who think they're doing something because they're hooking up with Potiphar. Come on, somebody. I want to hear you, somebody. You got a good job, okay? You made a little more than minimum wage, so you're doing somebody that's making more than that. And do you think that's the good life? Oh, I'm living my best life. They can go on and give me something. Yeah, he'll write me a check. She'll meet me wherever I want to meet me. And you think that's the good life, but God says you will be a ruler, glory to God. If you will throw all of that stuff aside, you will be a ruler if you'll tell him. You tell her, I can't do this. My God is too good for me to do this. I cannot turn my back on the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. This is the process that we're all going through. That's why I tell people I wouldn't want to go back and be young again. Jesus, no. Jesus, no. I lived that time. I ain't sure about the second time. <laughs> because there's some things that are much more available out here now than wasn't available. Lord, have mercy. I was born in 57, and by the time I turned 20, it was still wasn't but 77. <laughs> There's some things out here now that, Lord Jesus, I pray over these young people. I pray over these young people. I didn't have to make some of these choices. I didn't have to make some of these choices. 
I, I, Lord Jesus, I went to him when my boy was playing ball in middle school last year. And I go to the middle, and I was like, this middle school? What? It's a whole different world. They don't even look like children anymore. And Lord knows they don't act like children. And I'm like, oh, my God. Some of these babies are being exposed to stuff that I didn't even know about until I was like 20, 21. This is why we got to love and pray. Because your love for God and God loves for you. It's going to be the thing that keeps them until they can find God for themselves. This is what's going to keep them. This is what's going to keep things going. As we go home today, I want us to understand that waiting is not passive. Waiting is not doing nothing. Waiting is God saying, I want you to participate in your change. Come on. God is saying, I want you to participate in your change. You pray for change, but you don't want to be a part of your change. You think you're going to rub Aladdin's lamp or somebody come and do something and throw some oil on you and everything is going to be all right because I went to the altar. But you have to submit yourself to become a part of this process. Purpose is fluid and transitional when you're in the process. When you're in the process with God, you don't have time to be wondering what your purpose is because your purpose is in that moment. And it's fluid and transitional. And in so many Christians, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Wherever you are right now, that's what your purpose is. Because there is a greater purpose, but you'll never find it. And when you find a greater purpose, that doesn't mean that's the end of the road. Like I said last week, that's when you reload, you rest, and you get ready for next. God wants us to understand that as his children, we have to surrender for a good life. We have to surrender to live a skillful life. We have to surrender and trust him. We have to be intentional about our relationship with God. Have you, have you not seen? Have you not heard? Have, don't you know anything about the source of everything that you want? I said the source of everything that you desire. The source of everything that, that you have been believing for. He says you have to come out from among them and form a relationship all by yourself. You can't do this with nobody else because ain't nobody else going to get that blessing. You can't do this with nobody else because don't nobody know the troubles of your life. You can't do this with nobody else because nobody else has been invited by God. And sometimes you're missing out on what God has for you because you keep on inviting other people. Then God says, I've been waiting for you. And God shuts you down because you keep bringing these other people. Well, Lord, I just wanted to have somebody to touch and agree with me. He says, no, you and I will touch and agree. Yeah. Well, Lord, I just wanted to have somebody to, to, to verify. No, I will be your verification. I will be your validation. I will be your hope. I will be your answer. I will be your trust. Don't you pull nothing else from the flesh and the blood. Stay down on your knees. Stay down on your face. Talk to me. Pull over to the side of the road and cry if you got to. But put your faith and trust in me. Your life is not over. There are some things that God has driven out of your life. And you think the devil is doing it. You think they didn't want you no more. God says there's something better in your life that I got for you. There's something on the future that I got for you. But I got to get that other stuff out the way. Isaac couldn't come until I get rid of Ishmael because Ishmael would have messed up Isaac. Ishmael came from his flesh. Isaac came from the Lord. And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And he had to wait. 
He had to wait. He had been waiting from the days of the Garden of Eden when man first fell. He had been waiting. And the Bible says when the fullness of time had finally come, when God says, now is the perfect time. Now he can come. And when he come, he still had to wait. And the Bible says he grew. He grew in wisdom. He grew in virtue. He grew in stature. He grew in the eyes of men and the eyes of God. He grew. It was a growing period. Even though he was the son of the living God, there was a waiting period. There was a waiting period. Because it took some time for him to grow into accepting the cross. It took some time for him to grow into accepting, taking on the curse of the tree. He had to grow into that. He had to grow into accepting the torture and the beatings and the humiliation. He had to grow into that where the scripture says that he had to see the glory that was before him. In order to accept the suffering of the cross. God is trying to get you to understand today there's something before you. There's something before you. You're going through something right now, but it has nothing to do with where you're going because you're in the process right now. You're in the process, and God is saying, come on and work with me while I work on you. Work with me. It's not about your works. It's about your trust. It's not about your works. It's about your voice. It's not about what you can do with your hands and your feet. It's about what you can do with your mouth and praising me. Give me praise when it's going wrong. Give me praise when you're disappointed. Put your trust in me when everybody has turned and walked away from you. When your best laid plans went down the toilet, he said, trust in me. And then I will give you the desires of your heart. If this word has blessed you, give God a hand clap of praise this morning. Because we're going to get to our best life. We're going to go from good to better. Repeat after me. I will not settle for good. My God has better. Now point to yourself. For me. You got to live like this. You got to live like this. You got to live like this. You got to learn, learn to say no to the kings of Sodom. You can't try to make up for what you did with Melchizedek by taking something for the kings of Sodom. He never thought for one moment that what Sodom was going to give him was his payment for blessing Melchizedek. This is where we get it twisted. I have been a blessing, so now somebody, anybody, bless me. That's all the devil wants you to do, is to take what he offers, and you'll get hooked on him. Lord, I pray you bless these, your people, today. I thank you, Lord God, for every home, every family, not just those under the same roof, every family represented here today, Lord God. That this love, Lord God, that, that we have for you and the love that you have for us because you loved us first, Lord God, will be able to cover those, Lord God, who don't know you, Lord God, those who've given up on you, those who have turned their back on you, Lord God. The love that you have for us and the prayers that we send up to you, Lord God, will be sufficient right now because your grace is sufficient for all things, Lord God. We thank you right now, Lord God, for what you're doing. And we, oh, Lord God, we anticipate being entwined with you in such a way, Lord God, that we'll be standing in our best and living our best, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, knowing that it's not us, but it is us. Knowing that it's you, but it is us. Because you and I will become one. As I surrender myself more and more every day. Meet these, your people, Lord God. These are people in the place 
that they need you most. And help them not to abandon the process. But to continue to look to the other side. Where the blessing is going to come. I thank you in advance. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Lift your offering. And those.